Hi, it's Neil here. Yes, back again. You got me. It's International Accounting, Chapter 10. We're getting through this textbook, aren't we? We've skipped a few chapters, but we want to cover the essential ones for this first run through International Accounting. And we're looking at analysis of foreign financial statements. We're going to look at the overview of financial statement analysis. Now, what is the why for this? It's very important to understand the why. Let's think about it. What we're going to go through in this chapter is we're going to look at some of the reasons for analyzing financial statements. We're going to look at the potential problems, the solutions, and then we're going to introduce you to a way of restating financial statements. And I think it's very important that you have a go at doing a restatement, even a basic, simple one, just so you get to understand the real issue that are brought about by the fact that there's so much diversity around the world in terms of accounting standards. Still today, 2015, there is still diversity. As much as we want to have convergence and harmonization, there is still diversity. And if you're an analyst, if you're an investment advisor, if you are a due diligence consultant, if you are an asset manager, if you are looking to do a merger and acquisition in another country, at some point in time, you're going to be met with this issue of, oh, we've got financial statements. Oh, they're in a different country, different exchange rate. Oh, that's all right. We can do the foreign currency translation. Oh, different standard also. Oh, we need to restate also to find out what exactly is the value of this company. Are the accruals uh, stated in the correct way so we can actually compare that with other peers so we can make a proper evaluation for an acquisition, for example. So let's have a look at some of the reasons, the problems, the solutions, and then we're going to go through the mechanics of one restatement, shall we? Let's get into this good stuff. So learning objectives. We will discuss the reasons, the potential problems, and the solutions that diversity in financial statement standards in financial standards you know difference between ifrs and gap and variations of ifrs in different countries this diversity and the need to restate if you're going to make a more accurate decision wow you know this is the landscape so we just want to make the big thing you're going to take away from this is a greater appreciation of the pitfalls, the problems, the solutions, the stakeholders associated with this international accounting landscape. Isn't it great we're studying accounting? That's more work for the accountants. The less harmonization there is, the less convergence there is, there's more work for accountants. Okay, let's have a look here. So. Financial statement analysis, remember, it's about analysis of accounting analysis, which is more about the, it's about the history. It's about the economic history of an organization. It's about where the organization exists today economically. Financial analysis is more about the, what is the profitability of the organization? What is the current liquidity of the organization? Where, where are the risks of the organization? Where are they in terms of liquidity risk, cash flow risk, income generating risk? It's sort of a lot more financial analysis. It's very focusing on risk analysis. And then we've got prospective analysis. That is when we go outside of that accounting box and we look even broader than that, even broader. Um, we want to look at the environment. We want to look at the competition. We want to look at the strategy of the organization. We want to look at the non-accounting aspects, due diligence in non-accounting aspects. So we can really get a greater understanding of this cash flow that the, the company we're looking at is telling us that they're going to have in the future. Is it realistic? or is it too optimistic or is it too pessimistic? We need to get a sense of that by looking at the greater non-accounting aspects of the environment. So that's kind of what we're talking about with prospective analysis. So keep these terms in mind. You've got accounting analysis, which is a basic economic reality. Financial analysis is more the risk 
cash flow risk, liquidity risk, the profitability risk. Uh, the prospective analysis is actually going even broader and looking far into the future and trying to really understand all the elements that impact on a company's cash flows going into the future. Okay, so what are the reasons to analyze foreign financial statements? There are several reasons. We're gonna go through them pretty quickly here. Foreign portfolio investment. Investors can diversify some risk by investing internationally. Now let's have a look. Where's our little pointer here? We love our laser pointer here. There we go, we've got our beautiful laser pointer. Stock returns in many countries are positively correlated to US returns. But the correlations, the correlations are far from perfect. Besides, international investors, including managers of international mutual funds, rely on foreign financial statements. And so this is very important. This is a very important reason to analyze foreign financial statements. All right, here's another decision, international mergers and acquisition. That is a clear decision that requires huge due diligence, that requires huge statement analysis, requires huge analysis of the real value of an organization, let alone it being in another country under another accounting standard regime, okay? All right, so the frequency and size of international commercial mergers has increased in recent years. There's so many of them these days compared to 10, 20 years ago. The purchase of an international company needs to analyze the target company's financial statements for determining how much to pay. So there's a really key reason here that we need to really understand what is, what is the meaning behind a foreign financial statement in terms of standards, vis a -vis your own standards in your home country. So you can do a proper comparison here. What about other reasons? Making credit decisions about a foreign customer. For want of a better need is to look at if you could get information that is of a supplier's books in China and to try and understand what is the accounting of the supplier if it's large enough. Maybe they're listed so they've got financial statements that are publicly available but privately you can get access to them through a lawyer going to the various government offices in China because companies have to submit their statements to the various government regulatory authorities in China. So you can get this information. The question is, what standards were used to actually create that information? And so you may need that information so you can make credit decisions about a foreign customer maybe you need to make a decision about whether you want to invest with a supplier in China, whether you want to do a joint venture with a supplier in China, or whether you just want to buy from the supplier in China. Well, are they going to be around in six months time, 12 months time, 18 months time to supply to you? Evaluating the financial health of foreign suppliers, as I've just mentioned, and we've got benchmarking against global competitors, yes. Benchmarking, it's all about comparison. So you need an apples to apples comparison. All right, now we want to get into some of the problems. We've looked at some of the reasons why we want to do this. Here are the problems. Well, number one, data accessibility. All right, it's financial information is difficult to obtain in many countries. Fortunately, actually in China, you can get information on private companies in China. You have to pay for it. Most of the information is in Chinese and you normally get a lawyer to get that information for you. It takes a little bit of time but you can get access to information, even if they're not listed on the stock exchanges. In some ways, it, there's much more information available in China than there is on private companies in USA, or Europe, or UK. Very interesting, isn't it? So use that for your advantage if you're working with companies in China. While databases of foreign financial statements do exist, they contain errors and present in a variety of formats. Yeah, so this is the other thing. You may get that information, but the question is, has that information been audited? Probably not. Uh, has that information been presented, prepared with a particular objective in mind? Probably so. Do you know what objective in mind that information has been prepared under? Probably not, okay. Was that information prepared with the objective of enhancing the income beyond what the income really is or minimizing the income below what the income really is? Okay, so this is very important. You need to understand the objectives behind why, why the information has been prepared. So you can 
re-bias that information or you can understand better the real bias in information if any remember private information is not necessarily audited information so that's the tricky part okay another approach is combine a copy of the foreign company's annual report that would be great if it's submitted to the stock exchange okay it's fine it's been audited that's great yes annualreports.com provides reports of companies listed in u.s uk canada and australia stock exchanges now remember here's the deal okay you're looking at a foreign company you want data access what for merger and acquisition well it's highly likely that merger acquisitions is going to happen of other private companies in other countries not necessarily public illicit companies because in some ways public illicit companies are going to have inflated valuations you may have to pay much more than what you'd have to pay for an equivalent private company number two private companies are likely to be in earlier stages of their product development or brand development or they ha may have a new idea that's new on the scene whereas publicly companies may have been around for so long and they may have legacy assets they may not be in the early stages of a technology that you are looking for with your merger and acquisition so there are other considerations you need to think and when you bring everything together it may point you in the direction of looking for a non-publicly listed company and then you've got even more difficulty in working out the due diligence of the valuation of that company yes it's not easy you go one way or go the other you're darned if you do you're darned if you don't but you've got to grow don't you and most companies a lot of them seek external acquisition as a way of growing rather than growing internally they're so impatient these days we understand that there's money going out everywhere so what about the language that's a problem but we can overcome that with translation you can get foreign lawyers involved it's just going to cost you a little bit more a little bit cheaper in china still fortunately so do not do not hold back on actually getting lawyers to do due diligence on potential acquisitions of companies in china it's worth it's worth it to do that okay so there but there are problems all right once you're working in a different language you just need to realize is the same term the same term that you understand that term to be okay what about the currency okay well we've done we've done with currency in the chapter seven in chapter eight and we've looked at different methods of translating with currency the great the good news is that most currencies around the world of the countries that you want to do business with are tradable freely tradable most currencies and there is a market for most currencies so you can get free information you can get the information on the most updated rates of currencies in the market so that is kind of not as a big a problem as language or not as big as a problem as getting access to data in other countries but it is a problem and we did address that in chapter 7 and chapter chapter 8 of the Dopich and Pereira textbook yes what about terminology okay so there's lots of differences in terminologies exist and these are just different these are differences in style not necessarily differences in income or standards or valuation or liabilities it's not differences there money they're not difference quantitatively but it's difference in style what we call something so stock in one country is called inventory in another country shareholders in one country is called stockholders in another country so keep these in mind terminology understand that it's not going to change the numbers that much but you just got to look out for the different styles uh, that are used in statements across different countries what about format again associated with the terminology they like to use different names for different parts of the statement but of all these problems I think the biggest one is access to data and number two is access to audited data so you can get access to data in a lot of countries but if it's private organization it's not necessarily auditable so then you need to do further due diligence 
to really understand the full legal consequences of actually working with another entity. So does the entity own all the assets it claims to own? Is, is it liable for more liabilities that it is stating on a balance sheet? Did, it, did the entity you're looking at earn the income it said it earned? So if you're working with a non-listed company, suddenly you're thrust into the area, the realm of reporting by these entities that follow a certain objective, tax minimization objective, or some other biased objective. And so you need to understand what that bias is. I think that's the biggest challenge. Okay, and the extent of disclosure, that's another problem, as I mentioned, disclosure is going to be driven a lot by the bias it's going to be driven a lot by the purpose for which the financial statements are presented are made up and we know about these biases with public companies around the world but we don't always know that with private companies and so we need to have a bit more investigation of the potential misdisclosures of private companies in other countries and so you would pay a lawyer or an accountant to help do due diligence on financial statements if you're interested in looking at a non-listed company in another country yes so we've got a lot of issues here about the extent of disclosure and as I'm explaining to you these are the reasons why you need to do a lot of due diligence to get that information and to really recheck the information because a lot of the information that you can get may be biased for a particular objective in mind that that company that you're looking at has. Okay, what about another one? Timeliness. Mm, that's another problem in analyzing foreign financial statements. The aspect of the relevance of information, it varies significantly internationally since filing deadlines differ from country to country. So in the US, there's sort of like got a calendar year approach to filing, whereas in Australia, the financial year ends at the June 30 each year. And in Hong Kong, it ends at, I think, in March 30. So you sort of, there are different filing dates around the world. And the most easiest way is to compare quarter to quarter or to try and find the calendar year that of the company you're looking at and compare it with the calendar year of other competitors, other attorneys, or your own operations in your home country. So you've got to get that apples to apples comparison working in terms of the same timeline that you are looking at. What about differences in accounting principles? All right, so of course there are differences, a lot of differences as we noted early chapters in international accounting. IFRS is helping to iron out the differences, but there is still so much alternatives available to companies to choose what standards they use to recognize income, to recognize expenses, to amortize depreciation or intangibles, to recognize assets and liabilities. Some of the most troublesome areas are consolidations, fixed asset valuation, depreciation, and goodwill, yes. Right? They cause some investors to limit the scope of their investors' investments. Some investors attempt to reframe foreign financial statements to a more familiar gap, which is good. Another approach is use a stripped down measure of earnings that excludes items most affected by diversity. In other words, you're stripping down the measure of accruals of other short-term liabilities accounts payable, accounts received, and you're trying to understand what was the cash received or generated during the period. Ultimately, if you strip down so much, you actually got nothing at all. But then that may not tell you the full picture of the company in terms of how it generates income from year to year. And is that ability to generate income, is that growing or is that decreasing? These may be, this may be the information you're looking for, but it may not be showing up with a stripped down measure of earnings. What about international ratio analysis? Yeah, you need to be able to do this. International ratio analysis may be a way 
of getting an apples to apples comparison because it forces you to try and put in the same meaning and measurement of the denominator and numerator in each of the different ratios like the cash flow ratio like the return on assets ratio like the accounts receivable ratio and so forth and so this may be a way of structuring what the financial statements mean in a different currency and being able to compare those ratios with your company in your home country so ratio analysis is one way of structuring financial statements from different countries in different currencies so you can do a comparable meaning okay so we're not interested in the total amount of income we're interested in the return on sales we're not interested in the total profits we're interested in the return on equity you see what i mean so ratios bring absolute numbers which can't be compared between standard and standard or between country and country or different currencies they allow things to be more comparable because you're working with a common denominator and you've got a numerator that's working over that and so you're comparing a ratio from one country to another and you may have more success in getting more information by converting statements into ratios for ratio analysis so what about restating financial statements obviously if all things fail you need to do a restatement <gasps> wow restatement do we have to do a restatement well look i think it's very important for students of international accounting to understand some simple basics of restatement okay so at least be able to restate something about two or three items so you get the feel for what it means to do a restatement rather than you have to learn everything about restatements what matters is that you know a good starting point and so we're going to give you a simple example a simple example to show you how you could get started with a restatement what about the rules for restatements well form 20f foreign companies that file a non-us gap financial statements with the sec are required to complete a form 20f with the exception of those that use ifrs hmm this reconciles, hopefully, the Form 20th, net income and stockholders' equity to US GAAP. Interesting here. So it's not about reconciling the assets and liabilities directly. We're focusing on the net income and the stockholders' equity. All right. So note, there's no requirement to reconcile assets and liabilities. So it's sort of like a partial restatement from foreign gap to US gap under the form 20f some ratios such as return on equity can be computed as if under US gap most other ratios cannot be computed so analysts can overcome this by performing the restatement of financial statement items and so there are two steps involved here the first step is reformatting that is not changing the numbers but transforming the terminology differences and the presentation differences item definitions classification so it's actually just moving the numbers around so they look to be in the same place the assets are here the assets are here liabilities liabilities shareholders equity like that you see what i mean okay step two is actually a restatement overview and that involves restating foreign gap amounts to us so this is easier when a company files a form 20f because they provide more information behind their numbers sometimes companies will present a similar reconciliation without actually filing a form 20f so step two of two we finally want to have notes to the financial statements we want to refer to them because they will help you to complete the restatement of the foreign gap into the US gap amounts step one re mechanics okay you may have a four column worksheet where you have the assets liabilities income statement of 
the company in the foreign country under the other accounting standard and on this side you have the restatement into US GAAP and you have two columns in between that is your debit and credit and that shows the working paper how you went from this statement to this statement here and of course all the debit credits have to add up so it's very hard to make a mistake here that's step one we're getting them into the right accounting sequence and the right titles okay step two the mechanics again in the restating we want to make clear the debit and credit columns in the debit and credit columns which amounts are actually being restated okay and basically it's an adjusting and reclassification for example an income may be restated as a provision okay so no longer it's an income it now becomes a provision and now becomes a liability for example or an asset for example or an amortization may not be as much and so then that affects an asset amount in the balance sheet okay so what are we doing here we're really focusing the restatement on the income statement and the retained earnings and then these changes go into the final balance sheet we're not focusing on restating the final balance sheet in the first step the sequence is we look at the income statement and retained earnings first so let's have a look at the partial example assume that the local gap column of the financial statements being restated has already been reformatted into the US gap amounts titles into the US gap titles and amounts these amounts include sales two thousand dollars cost of sales eleven hundred dollars sales goods and administration expense two hundred other income one hundred retained earnings beginning five hundred retained earnings end thirteen hundred interesting year so the difference here assuming there's no provisions made is basically eight hundred dollars but if there are provisions then the retained earnings at the end is going to be less right or if they have dividends paid during the process during the accounting period then that's going to be less too cash 500 inventory 600 deferred liability 50 pension liability 800 now let's have a look at what has happened here shall we there are three things that have happened in this partial example under us gap the current pension liability costs are 40 units higher and the beginning balance in pension liability is 100 units higher so when we're referring to units we don't mean US dollars but we mean units in the foreign currency so it could be any dollar amount but we're just referring to them as units for now these costs are accounted for as sales good and administration expense mm. next cash is realized of 20 units during the current year and it's considered deferred liability under US GAAP and this other income under local GAAP so let's have a look at some of the calculations we've got here shall we okay so first we have pension liability costs let's do a one pension liability costs here 40 units high beginning balance in pension liability is 100 units higher so that's number two okay so this is at the beginning balance this doesn't affect income during a period whereas the first item does affect income during a period next cash is realized of 20 units during the current year it's considered a deferred liability under US GAAP and is other income under local GAAP so therefore you're going to have to change the recognition of this income we will call this number three so there are three items here three items and basically income has gone down by one hundred and sixty dollars how do we know that 40 plus 100 plus 20 in this translation and liabilities basically is going to go up by how much one hundred and sixty dollars like finally the balance sheet is going to reflect this difference but how do we get to that difference mm. okay now remember 
100 of this 160 was for the prior period, okay? Thus, retained earnings is affected for that 100 and only $60 is reflected in the changes in the income. Ah, you see? So this 100 units, this 100 out of that 160 impacts on retained earnings. It doesn't impact on the income. The other 60 does impact on the income. So even before we get to doing changes, you can read through this and just ask yourself, okay, of these changes, is income higher or lower? Is retained earnings at the beginning higher or lower? Get some sense for, I think, what's going up, what's going down? So when you actually do do the calculations and you come up with your final answer, at least you've got some intuitive sense of what that final answer should be. So let's have a look at the first step, shall we? So we have the two income amounts that are adjusting. We are actually increasing our sales good and administration expense by $40 we are reducing other income by $20 so other income is only $80 why did we do that remember cash realized of 20 units during the current year is considered a deferred liability okay so it's a deferred liability under US gap so we cannot add it to our income other income during that period when we move from local gap to US gap. All right, so we've got 20 less income here. We have 40 less income as a result of recognizing 40 units of more expenses here. So this is our one and this is our three. Now remember our number two. Our number two is this little baby here. And why is this here? Because now we're in the retained earnings statement and this is number two all right so let's just circle two so we know where we are number two this is the additional amounts that was moved to a pension liability as at uh, up until the prior period because and now it's in the retained earnings at the beginning of the period Okay, so it wasn't a provision made during the current period. It should have been in the retained earnings at the beginning of the period. So therefore, the retained earnings at the beginning is now 400 less. What does that mean? Well, it's 400 less because you have actually taken out what would have been an income here, 500, you've actually moved 100 into a provision, okay? It's a provision for pension liability. That provision is actually $100 more. So therefore the retained earnings, remember retained earnings is basically what's left in the piggy bank to pay out as dividends. There is $100 less in there under US GAAP because that $100, this $100 here, should be in a provision under US GAAP. It should be under the provision for pension liability under US GAAP. It is not in the local GAAP, current, in the local GAAP accounting standards. And so this is why we are making this adjustment. So what have we done here? Here we have, we've got 40. We've got 40 in more expenses under the US GAAP. We have 20 less in income under US GAAP. We have 100 more in provisions under US GAAP. And those provisions should have been recognized at in the prior period and then come into the retained earnings at the beginning of that period. So therefore, we need to reduce the retained earnings at the beginning by 100, of course that reduces retained earnings at the end also by 100 as you can see and so here we have the final balance sheet example 
where we have an increased deferred liability of 20 going under the gap balance sheet. We have that $100 extra in pension liability under US GAAP, plus we're making an extra provision during that period under US GAAP. So this one, this 40 is coming for the current period. This 100 should have been recognized in prior periods. And since we don't know when it was or how it should have been recognized, it basically comes up into the retained earnings at the beginning of the period, which should be $100 less. So now we've got to make that adjustment here in the current period and current period balance sheet. And all three of these items, 20 plus 100 plus 40 is 160. Now your retained earnings is now 160 less. And that's what we mean by making a financial transformation of the balance sheet from local gap, local gap here to US gap here. And that's how you do it. Keep in mind, you follow through, you're thinking about what's income, what's an expense. You're really just thinking at the end of what income items go up or down, what asset or liability items go up or down, because at the end of the day, if one something goes up, another thing must go up or down to counteract it. So in the end, everything must balance. It's just a matter of moving the numbers around on the income and the balance sheet deck. Final point to remember. What we did was not look at the balance sheet in the beginning. We just looked at the income statement and we looked at the retained earnings part, the shareholders equity of the balance sheet before we move to the final balance sheet to make any adjustments. So keep that in mind the sequence. Income statement, retained earnings as part of shareholders equity and then we go to the final balance sheet here. So. That brings us to the end of chapter 10. Financial statement analysis. What did we cover here? We looked at the reasons for why we want to have translation of financial statements, especially other country standards to your home country standard. We also looked at the problems. There are many problems associated with the translation of financial statements to your home country. And number three, we looked at a simple example for how you could actually do a simple translation. I hope going through this video that you can have a little bit more confidence in understanding this whole landscape of the diversity that accounting standards is causing of companies that are in different countries around the world. Still today, even with IFRS, the big umbrella, okay, because IFRS is still not US GAAP. IFRS still allows a range of alternative ways of recognizing income and valuing assets and liabilities and making provisions for various amortizations and changes of liabilities and things like that. So the point is that we want to develop your confidence and by going through the simple example at the end where we had three different items that were adjusted, we focused on the income statement, retained earnings, that went into the balance sheet and that completes the picture, hopefully to make you more aware, number one, number two, more confident to know that there are problems out there but you can find solutions to these problems if you get the right lawyers to do the due diligence or get the right accountants in the different countries that can make the adjustments for you your awareness of these issues is probably the most important thing here so thank you very much and see you in the classroom bye for now